This may be hard to believe, but the U.S. Air Force Academy used to educate its cadets about UFOs between 1968 and 1970. And this wasn't just some professor's opinion, this was in their textbook, which was confirmed by the Deputy Director of Public Information at the Air Force Academy. The cadets that enrolled in Physics 370 were required to have a textbook titled Introductory Space Science. The very last chapter in this textbook was titled Unidentified Flying Objects. And according to the Lemore Advance, the students were taught to stop scoffing at UFOs and instead to keep an open mind on the subject. This course was an elective that attracted about 20 students per semester. That means for the five semesters that this was in place, about 100 cadets were exposed to this information. But I got my hands on a copy of it, so I'm going to expose the rest of the world to this information. So make sure you hit that follow button. This textbook was written in 1968, back when the Air Force was still collecting UFO reports through Project Blue Book. But since the Air Force-sponsored Condon Report came out in early 1969 and stated that nothing had come from the study of UFOs in two decades, they decided to remove it from the curriculum. The findings of the Condon Report also resulted in the termination of Project Blue Book in that same year. Project Blue Book concluded by stating the following. No UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force has ever given any indication of threat to our national security. There has been no evidence discovered by the Air Force that sightings categorized as unidentified represent technological developments beyond the range of present-day scientific knowledge. There has been no indication that sightings categorized as unidentified are extraterrestrial vehicles. Based on those conclusions, the Air Force removed their chapter about UFOs and replaced it with a chapter called Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, which just so happens to be the term that they used in the Gillibrand Rubio Gallego Amendment, which establishes the next incarnation of Project Blue Book thanks to the signing of the NDAA for 2022. So you're not going to want to miss what comes next. I'm going to start off this deep dive into what the Air Force used to teach their cadets about UFOs by going over the conclusions first. They start off by concluding that from the available information, the UFO phenomena appears to have been global in nature for almost 50,000 years. And whatever these reliable people have witnessed, it could potentially be natural phenomenon, psychological in nature, or an unknown phenomena. But those possibilities are also questionable in view of some of the available data. This of course leaves us with the unpleasant possibility of alien visitors coming to Earth. And don't forget, this is the Air Force saying this, not me. And with the available but questionable data that exists, it suggests that there is at least three or four different groups of aliens, possibly at different stages of development, which is also difficult to accept. In 1968, this implied that there was life on the planets within our solar system, which I think has been ruled out at this point. Or it implies a surprisingly strong interest in Earth from members of other solar systems. And the authors of this chapter believe that the solution to the UFO problem may be obtained by a long and diligent effort of a large group of well-financed and competent scientists, similar in scope to the Manhattan Project. And the Gillibrand-Rubio-Gallego Amendment might finally be the beginning of that effort. But at the time, there was no evidence that such an effort was going to be made. But even if this effort is taken on, there is no guarantee of success due to the isolated and sporadic nature of sightings. And the possibility does exist that there may not be anything to find, which means we would be chasing our tails. So the Air Force recommended to their future leaders that the best thing to do is to keep an open and skeptical mind, and to not take an extreme position on any side of this question. And it sounds like the same thing I've been saying to you guys is the most important part of looking into this topic is to think for yourself. Next, we get into the meat of the chapter. Part 3 on the Air Force Academy's chapter on UFOs. In the introduction, they start by asking, what is a UFO? Time out, time out. Before we dig into this, I want to challenge you guys. I want to challenge you to suspend your judgment. And instead of focusing on what information they're presenting and if you believe it or not, I want you to ask yourself something. Why? Why would the Air Force be presenting this information to their future leaders? So keep that in the back of your mind as you process the rest of this information. So what is a UFO? Well, according to Air Force Regulation 8017, a UFO is any aerial phenomenon or object which is unknown or appears out of the ordinary to the observer. 
This, of course, is a very broad definition, and it applies equally well to someone that's seeing their first noctilucent cloud at twilight, or another individual that's seeing a helicopter for the first time. But most people consider the term UFO to mean an object which behaves in a strange or erratic manner while moving through the Earth's atmosphere. This strange phenomena has evoked strong emotions and great curiosity among a large segment of the world's population. The average person is interested because he loves a mystery. The professional military man is involved because of the possible threat to national security. And some, but not all, scientists are interested because of the basic curiosity that led them into becoming researchers in the first place. The literature associated with UFOs is vast and the stories are varied, so they could only provide a sketchy outline of the subject in this chapter. So this is what we'll be covering going forward. The Air Force Academy teaches its cadets about UFOs, part four. Next, they go into detail about the descriptors used to categorize UFOs. But of course, one of the greatest problems you encounter when attempting to catalog UFO sightings is... Which selection system for categorizing UFOs to choose? Because although numerous different systems have been proposed, no effective system has yet been devised. The net result is that almost all UFO data is either treated as an individual case, or in the form of inadequate classification systems. However, these systems do tend to have some common factors including the following. They also share some similar behavior traits, such as the ones listed here. And the ones that stand out to me are the flight characteristics, as well as avoidance. Because those comments match up closely to what General Nathan Twining said back in 47, where he described their flight performance characteristics and considered them evasive. There's also some commonality with the associated effects of these sightings, which include electromagnetic, so that's going to be like sensor interference, as well as radiation, which is going to be medical burns and things like that. And those radiation burns are things that would fall under the sixth observable, which is biological effects. Which is something that's going to be addressed by the Gillibrand Rubio Gallego Amendment. The associated effects are continued above, and they do include debris, which I find highly interesting. And then they describe some after effects, which are not so pleasant. But that's the end of the descriptor section, and next we're going to move on to my favorite part, history. Once there was a small group of beings who supposedly came to Earth many thousands of years ago in a metal craft which orbited the Earth several times before landing. These beings lived to themselves and were revered by the humans among whom they had settled. But eventually differences arose among them and they divided their numbers. Several of the men and women and some children settled in another city where they were promptly installed as rulers by the awe-stricken populace. Separation did not bring peace to these people. Finally, their anger reached a point where the ruler of the original city took with him a small number of his warriors and they rose into the air in a huge shining metal vessel. While they were many leagues from the city of their enemies, they launched a great shining lance that rode on a beam of light. It burst apart in the city of their enemies with a great ball of flame that shot up to the heavens, almost to the stars. All those who were in the city were horribly burned, and even those who were not in the city but nearby were burned also. Those who looked upon the lance and the ball of fire were blinded forever afterward. Those who entered the city on foot became ill and died. Even the dust of the city was poisoned, as were the rivers that flowed through it. Men dared not go near it, and it gradually crumbled into dust and was forgotten by men. When the leader saw what he had done to his own people, he retired to his palace and refused to see anyone. Then he gathered about him those warriors who remained and their wives and children, and they entered their vessel and rose one by one into the sky and sailed away nor did they return. And that cheerful story is how the Air Force Academy decided to start the next section of their chapter, Operational Domains Temporal and Spatial. This story came out of one of the oldest chronicles of India, the Book of Zan. That is a group of storyteller legends which were finally gathered in manuscript when man learned to write. But once again, try not to focus on whether or not you believe this account, but try to ask yourself, why would the Air Force present this information to their future leaders? To be continued. The Air Force Academy's operational domains continued. 
In this section, they present evidence that UFOs are a global phenomenon which has persisted for many thousands of years. During this discussion, please remember that the more ancient the report, the less sophisticated the observer. The ancient observers were lacking the necessary terminology and concepts to understand the true nature of such things as television, spaceships, rockets, nukes, and radiation effects. To some, the most advanced technological concept was a war chariot with knife blades attached to the wheels. So could the legend in the previous video really be an account of an extraterrestrial colonization? So could the legend in the previous video actually be an accounting of extraterrestrial colonization complete with guided missiles, nukes, and radiation effects? Just as it is difficult to explain why Greek, Roman, and Nordic mythology all discuss wars and contacts among their gods. Even the Bible records conflict between the legions of God and Satan. Could it be that each group recorded their parochial view of what was actually a global conflict among alien colonists or visitors? That's the Air Force asking you that question, not me. Or is it that man has led such a violent existence that he tends to expect conflict and violence even amongst his gods? They then discuss some 47,000 year old carvings that show people with large trunks potentially a breathing apparatus or potentially elephant heads on human bodies. But I couldn't find a picture of these carvings so I don't know what to do with this information. They then talk about some 8,000 year old rock sculptures in the Sahara that appear to be people wearing helmets and it sounds very similar to the drawings that I found above. And even more recently the Bible tells of angels from the sky mating with women of earth who bore them children. And when Lot met two angels in the desert and later fed them at his house. The Bible also tells the rather unusual story of Ezekiel who witnessed what has been interpreted by some as a spacecraft in 593 BC. To be continued, again. Operational domains continued. Even the Irish have recorded strange visitations, including numerous stories of demon ships in their skies as recorded in the Speculum Regali around 956 AD. Stories such as these makes one wonder if legends of the little people of Ireland were based on imagination alone. At about the same time in France, three men and a woman supposedly descended from an airship or a spaceship and were captured by a mob. These foreigners admitted to being wizards and were promptly killed, but they don't have any record of how they coaxed that confession out of them. In a sworn statement from 1897, a prominent farmer named Alexander Hamilton told of an attack upon his cattle on a cold Monday night at 10.30. He, his son, and a tenant attempted to protect their cattle from the great cigar-shaped ship that was 300 feet long and floating 30 feet above the cattle. The next day, a neighbor found the remains of one cow that they weren't able to protect. He was mystified at how the remains got to where they were because of the lack of tracks in the soft soil. 1957, at a fort in Brazil, two centuries noted a new star in the sky that grew in size and within seconds stopped over the fort. It drifted slowly downwards and it was as large as a big aircraft and surrounded by a strong orange glow. This assault was documented by the local newspaper as seen in this image. A distinct humming sound was heard and then the heat struck. One century collapsed almost immediately, the other managed to slide to shelter under the heavy cannons where his loud cries awoke the garrison. While the troops were scrambling toward their battle stations, complete electrical failure occurred. There was a panic until the lights came back on, but a number of men still managed to see an orange glow leaving the area at high speed. Both centuries were badly burned, one unconscious and the other incoherent, suffering from deep shock. The Air Force Academy textbook concludes this section of their chapter about UFOs by stating the following. Thus, UFO sightings not only appear to extend back 47,000 years through time, but also are global in nature. So one has to have the feeling that this phenomenon deserves some sort of valid scientific investigation, even if it is a low-level effort. Next up is some theories about the nature of the UFO phenomenon. Some theories that the Air Force taught their cadets about the nature of the UFO phenomenon. They admit that there are very few cohesive theories as to the nature of UFOs, but that they can be broken down into five general groups. Mysticism. It's believed by some cults that the mission of UFOs and their crews is a spiritual one, and that all materialistic efforts to determine the UFO's nature are doomed to failure. 
hoaxes and rantings due to unstable personalities, and some people have suggested that all UFO reports can be explained by this category. This attitude was particularly prevalent during the time period when the Air Force investigation was being operated under the code name Project Grudge. A few airlines even went as far as to ground every pilot who reported seeing a flying saucer. The only way for the pilot to regain flight status was to undergo a psychiatric examination. As you would expect, there was a noticeable decline in pilot reports during this time interval. And the remnants of this stigma still exist in 2022. And conveniently, a few interpreted this decline in pilot reports to prove that UFOs were either hoaxes or the result of unstable personalities. There are a number of cases which indicate that not all reports fall into the hoax category. At this point, they refer to the Lonnie Zamora case in Socorro, New Mexico. A few individuals have proposed that UFOs are actually advanced weapon systems, and that their nature must not be revealed. Very few people accept this as a credible suggestion. But almost all of those people comment on my videos, go check it out. Natural Phenomena It has been suggested that at least some and possibly all of the UFO cases were just misinterpreted manifestations of natural phenomena. Undoubtedly, this suggestion does have some merit. It has also been suspected that people have reported mirages, optical illusions, swamp gas, and ball lightning. The swamp gas explanation was actually used in 1966 to debunk a bunch of Michigan sightings. But it is difficult to tell a swamp dweller that the strange, fast-moving light he saw in the sky was swamp gas, and it is just as difficult to tell a farmer that a bright UFO in the sky is the same ball lightning that he has seen rolling along his fence wires in dry weather. Last suggestion is that UFOs could possibly be plasmoids from space. But this last suggestion does not seem to be very plausible because it ignores things such as penetration of Earth's magnetic field. Alien Visitors the most stimulating theory to us is that UFOs are material objects that belong to beings that are alien to this planet. At this point in the textbook, the Air Force asked their cadets to consider the case of Betty and Barney Hill. Next up is types of reported aliens. What the Air Force Academy told their cadets about the types of reported aliens. The most commonly described alien is about three and a half foot tall, has a round head, long arms, and is wearing a silvery space suit or coverall. Your typical alien gray. Other aliens appear to be essentially the same as Earthmen. These are referred to as Nordics, while still others have particularly wide eyes and mouths with very thin lips. There is a rare group reported that's about 4 foot tall, 35 pounds, and covered in thick hair or fur. Members of this last group are described as being extremely strong. So if such beings are visiting Earth, two questions arise. Why haven't there been any accidents which have revealed their presence, and why haven't they attempted to contact us officially? The answer to the first question may exist partially in Lonnie Zamora's experience, and may exist partially in the Tunguska meteor discussed in a previous chapter in the textbook. In that chapter, it was suggested that the Tunguska meteor was actually a comet which exploded in the atmosphere. The ice melted away, the dust spread out, hence no debris. However, it has also been suggested that the Tunguska meteor was actually an alien spacecraft that entered the atmosphere too rapidly, suffered mechanical failure, and lost its power supply and or weapons in a nuclear explosion. While that hypothesis may seem far-fetched, samples of tree rings from around the world revealed that immediately after the Tunguska meteor explosion, the level of radioactivity in the world rose sharply for a short period of time. It is difficult to find a natural explanation for that increase in radioactivity, although the suggestion has been advanced that enough of the meteor's great kinetic energy was converted into heat and a fusion reaction occurred. That still leaves us with no answer to the second question, why no contact? That question is very easy to answer in several ways. One, we may be the object of intensive sociological and psychological study. In such studies, you usually avoid disturbing the test subject's environment. 2. You do not contact a colony of ants, and humans may seem that way to any aliens. 3. Such contact may have already taken place secretly, such as the rumored meeting between Dwight Eisenhower and alien ambassadors on February 20th, 1954. 4. Such contact may have already taken place on a different plane of awareness, and we are not yet sensitive to communications on such a plane. These are just a few of the possible reasons. You may add to the list as you desire. Next up is human fear and hostility. 
what the Air Force Academy told their cadets about human fear and hostility in relation to the UFO phenomenon. Besides the reasons we just discussed about why aliens haven't contacted us already, contacting humans is downright dangerous. Just think about that for a minute. On the microscopic level, our bodies reject and fight any alien material. This process helps us fight off disease, but it also sometimes results in allergic reactions to innocuous materials. On the macroscopic level, we are antagonistic to beings that are different. And in case you're hesitant to extend that concept to the treatment of aliens, let me point out that in very ancient times, possible extraterrestrials may have been treated as gods. But in the last 2,000 years, the evidence is that any possible aliens that tried to contact humanity have been ripped apart, shot at, assaulted, and in general treated with fear and aggression. Including in Ireland in 1000 AD where supposed airships were treated as demon ships. And Russian anti-aircraft batteries opened fire on UFOs near the Coral Islands in 1957. The United States Air Force has also fired on UFOs. Once again, that's the Air Force saying it, not me. One morning, a radar site near a fighter base picked up a UFO and scrambled two F-86s to intercept it. Eventually, one F-86 closed in on the UFO, which began to accelerate away, but the pilot still managed to get within 500 yards of the target for a short period of time. It was definitely saucer-shaped. As the pilot pushed the F-86 at top speed, the UFO began to pull away. When the range reached 1,000 yards, the pilot armed his guns and fired in an attempt to down the saucer. He failed and the UFO pulled away rapidly, vanishing in the distance. The same basic situation may have happened on a more personal level in 1955 in Kelly, Kentucky, where one of the children that lived on the Sutton Farm saw a brightly glowing UFO settle behind their barn. That night, the entire family was harassed by strange-looking little men. The Sutton family shot, hit, but didn't kill any of the intruders. This event changed the town forever and they now celebrate it as the Little Green Men Days Festival. This reported event does bear out the contention though that humans are dangerous. Because at no time in the story did the supposed aliens shoot back, although one is left with the impression that the described creatures were having fun scaring humans. Next up is attempts at scientific approaches to the UFO phenomenon. Attempts at Scientific Approaches to the UFO Phenomenon In any scientific endeavor, step number one is to acquire data. Step two, classify the data. Step three, form a hypothesis. And then rinse and repeat. But unfortunately, UFOs do not cooperate with the scientific method. Due to their excessive variety and vagueness. This vagueness is caused by witnesses being caught by surprise and not having the proper equipment. And in addition to this, there is a very high level of noise in the data, much of which can be contributed to these previously discussed topics. In addition, data that does appear to be valid exhibits an excessive amount of variety relative to the statistical samples which are available. This has led to a very clumsy classification system, which in turn provides quite unfertile ground for the formation of hypotheses. The textbook then goes on to reference the work of Jacques and Janine Vallée in their book, Challenge to Science, the UFO Enigma. So make sure you go buy this book. So it's obvious that intensive scientific study is needed in this area. But in 1968, no such study had yet been undertaken at the necessary levels of intensity and support. But fingers are crossed that the Gillibrand Rubio Gallego Amendment is the beginning of that effort. One thing that must be guarded against in any such study is the trap of implicitly assuming that our knowledge of physics is complete. An example of one such trap is selecting a group of physical laws which we now accept as valid and assume that they will never be superseded. Five such laws are as follows. 1. Every action must have an opposite and equal reaction. 2. Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. 3. Energy, mass, and momentum are conserved. 4. No material body can have a speed as great as the speed of light in free space. 5. The max energy which can be obtained from a body at rest is E equals mc squared. They then go on to say a bunch of sciencey stuff to really drive their point home, but it's beyond my understanding, so if you want to, please pause this video and try to interpret it for yourself.
They closed this section by stating that we should not deny the possibility of alien control of UFOs on the basis of preconceived notions not established as related or relevant to the UFOs. Now make sure you go back and watch the third video in this series where they lay out their conclusions. And if you've made it this far, congratulations, you made it to graduation day.